Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Peter Lillian Thor, and uh, at least on my screen in galleries, uh, next to me is Alyssa Kaplan, who uh, actually uh, on Sunday uh, uh, became our past president, unfortunately. And fortunately, she's been terrific. And I am the new president of the Jewish Historical Society of Fairfield County. And I'm very happy to meet you all some of whom I know for some time, including Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, <laughs> you changed your outfit, Ruth. What's going on? She's a regular on the show. She's a regular on the show. But I, I must say that uh, uh, both roles fit her very well. And uh, thank you all for coming. And, uh, uh, and as usual, we're going to be looking forward to this wonderful book talk that we have. Looking forward to spending some good time with you all. Let's see. So, hello, everybody. Introduction. I think I do these just so that I can hear the nice words that you have to say. They bolster me up for the rest of the year. Um, and to my doubting friends, I am wearing a bathing suit and a bathing cap. After all, I have a reputation to uphold. Um, people still come up to me and they point at me and they say, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and they giggle. And when I did a book review on Dr. Ruth, I was trying desperately to come up with an outfit to wear, but I just decided I was really just too big to do it. So I gave up on that. Um, I'm wearing a bathing suit and a bathing cap today because we are reviewing Lawrence Adler Swims Forever. And before I get started, I have to make a special shout out welcome to my sister, Joan Kaufman, and our daughter, Deborah Katz, who are here today, I think, to keep me honest. Um, the book is a debut novel of Rachel Beanland, and it's an old-fashioned historical fiction in the very best sense. Its characters are engaging, and it's very good at historical setting, uh, particularly of 1930s Atlantic City, with its family-owned hotels, and they were beginning at that time to yield to the larger commercial palaces. Um, it was also, I was surprised to find, it was known as the Jewish Riviera, probably because in, in, in those fraught times, it was a place where Jews could comfortably vacation. And they did, annually for sun-drenched trips. Uh, the, the story does a fine job of enveloping the reader in a time and a place that's very rich with details and historical background events. To provide a little more atmosphere for all of you about it, I discovered a 1940s promotional video 
And David, can we share it with everybody? Sure, we'll do that now. Not so many years ago, this eastern seashore city with its spectacular skyline was an obscure little fishing village. Today, Atlantic City stands preeminent among the great resorts of the world, chiefly because of its year-round popularity. The famous boardwalk, Pulse Quickening, is an enduring inspiration to all who traverse this broad marine esplanade. Seven miles of broad, firm, gently sloping white sand borders the tossing, tumbling surf and provides a vast summer playground. Visitors to Atlantic City come from every state and from many foreign countries. Airlines reach Atlantic City in just a matter of hours from any part of the United States. Modern highways provide easy access by private automobile or by comfortable buses. Where you stay in Atlantic City is a matter of personal choice. There are luxurious hotels fronting the boardwalk and ocean, but there are also many others, less pretentious, but thoroughly comfortable. Lacking in some of the luxury and elegance of the larger hotels and yet matching them in comfort, the moderately priced hotels furnish accommodations of a superior excellence for the reasonable rates quoted. But wherever you stay in Atlantic City, there is a stimulating range of activities available to you, and there are special entertainment programs in many of the hotels. Whichever the hotel of your choice, your Atlantic City visit will be a joyous adventure. The Atlantic City Beach Patrol is a model of efficiency. These trained lifeguards keep a watchful eye on sunbathers as well as on swimmers in the surf. Many of today's newlyweds find Atlantic City an ideal place for a honeymoon. Others remember similar days of long ago brought back to reality by modern youth. While Grandma and Grandpa watch this happy couple, memories of Atlantic City 40 years ago return. Well, they sat in almost this same spot on this same beach on their honeymoon. Oh yes, times were a bit different, and so were the bathing suits. The same fun-loving couples came to Atlantic City in those years. Yes, even 70 years ago, this vacation spot was catching on. And during the gay 90s, Atlantic City achieved its present preeminence as a favorite seashore rendezvous. The water's a little cold for our young Nelly. So back to the beach while young Arthur pouts a bit. Fond memories, happy days of two decades ago, enjoyed again today. For young or old, Atlantic City is good for mind and body. Here you relax in the invigorating sea air and cool breezes. But back to the boardwalk. These boardwalk rolling chairs are a long-established institution and provide the opportunity to enjoy a restful ride along the traffic-free wooden thoroughfare. 
With the ocean on one side and interesting shops on the other, the colorful life of the boardwalk is fascinating. Unique among world institutions, the boardwalk is perhaps most adequately described to those who have never seen it by likening it to the deck of an immense ocean liner, a <laughs> ship seven miles in length. Although Atlantic City is essentially an ocean bathing resort, you may prefer a swimming pool. Here you may swim or dive to your heart's content. Or just sit and enjoy the sun. Refreshing ocean ozone assures healthy appetites and mealtime comes none too soon. If it's activity one wants at Atlantic City, it is here, strenuous or simple, and ready for any age from 3 to 90. Lucky girl. For presidents or just plain ordinary folk, Atlantic City provides the restful atmosphere of a perfect vacation spot. When night comes, another world is available. A world of entertainment in many fine restaurants, nightclubs, and amusement piers. Within Atlantic City's Mammoth Convention Hall, we find a delightful ice extravaganza. This is poetry in motion. Each summer, these graceful skaters rehearse the new Ice Capade show, which then plays throughout the winter in many leading cities coast to coast. Next morning, it's a new and exhilarating experience to pedal down the boardwalk with the song of the sea in our ears. Here, where there are no traffic hazards, we are truly without a care in the world. Horseback riding lends a smart, colorful touch to Atlantic City life from October to June, when the entire beach is given over to this exhilarating form of recreation. Many Shetland ponies are the daily delight of the children during these months. Thank you, David. Thank you so much. Um, I have memories of some of those things. I'm sure some of you do too. Um, and I was initially attracted to the story because when I was a youngster in the 40s, and my sister too, it was a family tradition to go to Atlantic City. Mind you, not to bask in the sun-drenched sands in the summer, Instead, my father used to drag us there in the middle of winter. He firmly believed that uh, the good sea air and walking on the freezing boardwalk would uh, cure us of our winter colds. And I could never understand why he schlepped us to the tip of New Jersey all the way from Jamaica, New York. But now learning that it was called the Jewish Riviera, I think I can understand I think that um, Jews at that time were comfortable in going a place where they wouldn't um, meet any kind of prejudice. In the early 1850s, a Dr. Pitney, he felt that the island had potential as a good health resort. He convinced a partner to join him and together they built the Camden Atlantic City Railroad. And on July 5th, 1854, the first train from Camden um, ended in Atlantic City. And he was correct. It was a very popular resort and finally luxurious hotels and cheap rooming houses began to spring up all over town. However, sand was a major problem. Uh, people began trekking it into every building, including some of the luxurious hotels. And so in 1870, 
a conductor on the Camden Atlantic City Railroad came up with an idea. He proposed a boardwalk. It would run from the beach to the town. And at the cost of half of Atlantic City's budget that year, they built a boardwalk. By 1880, it had to be enlarged. It was so popular. The area grew rapidly. Uh, there were um, enormous electric signs, which were new to the times, and rambunctious, colorful amusement piers. They started to hug the boardwalk from side to side. But the city had a problem. Tourism dropped off as soon as the weather cooled down, except of course for my father and my intrepid family. And as an attempt to keep the tourists there, in 1921, it um, became famous for a beauty contest, which was known as Miss America Contest. In 1923, the Flanders Hotel became emblematic of luxury accommodations. It was nine stories tall, and the suites had kitchens and an outside pool and a fitness center and day spas and even complimentary beach access. During World War II, the convention hall was used as an army training facility. And then in the 50s and 60s, celebrated um, actors and actresses and entertainers appeared there. But by the late 60s, cheap airfare and a growing sophistication of the population um, began the city's decline. Um, and if that sounds familiar, it, it was parallel to what was going on in the Catskills too. And in 1976, New Jersey voted to allow gambling. They had high hopes that this would reinflate their sagging economy. And in the picture, they talked about several of the uh, iconic aspects of Atlantic City. Uh, for instance, the steel pier. It was iron pilings that had been driven into the ocean ground, topped by steel girders. The original pier jutted out about 1,600 feet from the boardwalk. And it cost a magnificent at that time, $350,000 to build. Uh, but the nation's top entertainers came there. People like Marilyn Monroe and Benny Goodman and Jimmy Durante. And later it became just an amusements only attraction. And the rolling chairs that you saw in the picture, they were introduced in the 1880s. Um, and since wheeled vehicles were prohibited on the boardwalk, uh, these were only for people who couldn't walk. They were called invalid chairs. But other people got the idea that uh, it really would be nice to have someone wheel them down the lengthy boardwalk. And so it became a going business. Uh, and then saltwater taffy. I, I was going to bring all of you a sample of saltwater taffy, but your dentists said absolutely no. <laughs> it was first introduced in Atlantic City in the 1880s, and it's still popular 125 years later. Legend has it that in 1888, uh, a candy store was flooded with seawater, but uh, the uh, owner, being entrepreneurial, he started to bill it as saltwater taffy, and the name stuck. And although water is used in its preparation, there's really no seawater in the taffy. <clears throat> and now I just want to mention Charles Darrow. He was an unemployed salesman and he came from Philadelphia. Uh, he's credited with inventing the game of Monopoly, which is associated with Atlantic City. He had spent his summers there as a child and he uh, took a lot of time to draw the city streets, I don't know why his mother let him, on uh, the kitchen tablecloth. And he started to add hotels and houses and other little tokens to go along with it. Um, and soon friends and family would gather around the kitchen table and they would begin to buy and rent and sell uh, real estate for vast sums of money. And it quickly became a favorite activity among those who had very little real cash of their own. And uh, friends wanted copies, so he made up some copies and he began to try to sell them 
in the department stores in Philadelphia. Finally, in 1935, Parker Brothers became interested in the game. It became a classic, and the royalties made uh, Charles Darrow a millionaire, and there's even a commemorative plaque in his honor, and as you might conclude, it stands on the boardwalk near the corner of Park Place. Um, and if anybody at this point has any memories of early visits to Atlantic City, I'd love to hear, love to have you share them with us. Marcy, uh, I too went there in the winter time. I don't know, and we stayed at the Traymore Hotel and we have pictures of us walking on the boardwalk films. And it's uh, not just my family, my uncle's the families came too. And uh, I don't know if it's because it was, I didn't hear this. I think my parents were just cheap and didn't want to pay summer rents, rates. But anyway, <laughs> but, I, but I do remember we always would go to James Taffy and we would get like a, it's a barrel and it became a bank afterwards. It right. was a white and with light blue, uh, you know, on it. And that was, we'd get that every year. So we'd have these banks, but, uh, and of course, the, and of course the steel pier. But the train wall got imploded when they started rebuilding. But it was one of the real luxury hotels. I think one of the pictures in that film, the really big hotel, I think that was the train wall. I think you're right. Anybody else can come up with any memories? Okay, well, maybe we'll generate them as we tell you the story. Um, David, may we have the cast list? Okay, the, um, the story is set in the summer of 1934, and it wraps around three generations of the Adler clan, illuminating their romances, their marriages, and most significantly, each of their secrets. Joseph and Esther Adler have worked very hard at their small bakery. And by 1934, they ran a successful, large commercial bakery in Atlantic City. And they have two daughters, Florence of the title, and her older sister, Fanny. Fanny has gone the traditional route of the era. She refused to go to college and she marries Isaac Feldman. Her parents are not thrilled with her choice as Isaac has a habit of making very poor financial decisions. She's also the mother of seven-year-old Gussie and she's pregnant again <clears throat> soon after the loss of her second child, and she's ordered to remain in the hospital on bed rest. And in historic contrast, uh, Beanland talks about the birth of the Dion quintuplets, who had just been born to great fanfare. And Fanny decries that a woman who already has five children should have five more, while she has so much trouble just having two. In contrast to her, her younger sister Florence is a very successful student and a great swimmer. <clears throat> In 1926, Trudy Eberly had just captured the world's imagination by swimming the English Channel in 12 hours. Florence is an excellent swimmer and Eberly's feet inspired her to work toward that goal as well. And in an additional story, excuse me, let me just grab a little drink. In an additional storyline, the Atlas are playing host to Anna Epstein, a young Jewish woman who has left Germany soon to attend college in New Jersey. <clears throat> On the beach that fateful day, Florence, Anna, and the child Gussie. Florence goes into the ocean for a swim. And as Joseph and Esther come down to the beach, they notice that the lifeguards are scrambling to push a lifeboat out into the water. All are gathered as the lifeguards return to the beach with the lifeless body of Florence. The title character is only alive for the first 12 pages of the novel. 
but the author has managed to make her so vivid, it's clear why she was not forgotten by her family and even inspired by her descendants, like Rachel Beanland, several generations later. Esther, a strong-willed mother, decides peremptorily to keep Florence's death from Fanny. <clears throat> she worries that the shock might cause her to miscarry. Is this a correct decision? Even in Beanland's family, after these many years, the author says in an interview that the decision is just never discussed. Actually, I thought about it as I realized this decision doesn't seem so odd. I can really relate it to my own family. <clears throat> shah, shah, the children can hear. The older members of the family would only discuss desertions, divorces, firstborn babies at nine pounds who were born at six months of age, and of course, the big C, cancer, in hushed tones, or more frequently, in Yiddish. Mm -hmm. And as an example, um, my sister will, will attest to this, our aunt and uncle were married probably for 40 years. They've been dead 30 years. And yet, we just recently learned that my uncle wasn't Jewish. <laughs> In order to keep this secret, Esther had to secure the compliance of the hospital staff, the family, and even the local newspaper and her seven-year-old granddaughter. The machinations became problematic and they provide many of the incidents in the story. <clears throat> Besides Trudy Eberle's channel swim and the Dion Quintuplet's birth, there are other world events that provide a backdrop. The novel takes place in the shadow of the approaching Holocaust. Anna is another character who gains an importance after Florence's death. She's the daughter of a childhood friend of Joseph's and her parents have sent her to the Adlers to help her go to college in the US since she can't get into one in Germany. Joseph's early European relationship with Anna's mother is another secret in the story. This book quickly hooked me. I finished it in one fell swoop, but the characters stayed with me and I enjoyed it even more on my second reading. I think that Beanland captures what families are really like. The juxtaposition of a tragedy set against the background of a vacation city I was so familiar with makes the story all the more compelling. Beanland takes readers through a family saga brimming with secrets and the guilt that the characters suffer. It also shows how some traditional rituals and beliefs in Judaism were followed unquestionably, while many others began to be modified. For example, the day after Florence's shiva is over, her father returns to the office in the bakery. He drags a chair he rented from the beach up into the office. Once inside the office, Joseph closed the door behind him and locked it. And then he walks over to the window and he rolled down the shade. He leaned the beach chair against the fireplace and went to his desk where he rooted through his own drawers looking for the stub of a candle. He used the matches in his pocket to warm the wax and secure the candle to the lid of an empty coffee can. Then he placed this makeshift candle holder on the mantel. He lit a candle and said a prayer. When he was sure that the flame would not go out, he unfolded the beach chair. The Talmud describes Job's suffering as he mourned the loss of his children. His friends sat down with him to the ground for seven days and seven nights, but no one said a word to him because they perceived that his pain was very severe. Job and his progeny have been dead for more than 2000 years, but shiva chairs are still intentionally slung low to allow mourners to sit as close to the ground as possible. Joseph sat down heavily in his makeshift shiva chair. 
He buried his head in his hands and wept. On the other hand, when Stuart Williams, a non-Jew who loved Florence, wants to say something at the funeral, Esther voices an objection. He can't, he can't, he's not a Jew. But when the rabbi wants to perform Kriya, the cutting of the clothing of a mourner, Esther steps in again. She says, he can't. It would ruin her son-in-law's only jacket. When the book ended, I was disappointed not to be able to continue learning what happens to the characters that I had grown so fond of. I highly recommend it. It's a short, sweet book with characters and dialogue that ring true. And I hope that Beanland writes others. The story is built around Esther's decision to keep Florence's death a secret from her pregnant sister. Of course, Esther worried that the knowledge of her sister's death might cause a miscarriage. No one questions her decision, either in the story or now. We know that when Fanny did lose her newborn son a year earlier, she suffered because since he was three weeks old, tradition would not let her name him or have a funeral for him. So how do you think that this decision now is going to affect Fanny, not knowing about her sister's death? Um, and I'd like your opinion on matters related to this. For instance, is it ever justifiable to keep a secret of this nature from a loved one? What circumstances do you think justify this kind of action? And do you believe that family secrets have changed over the years? Is this good or not? Give you a minute to think and then see if anybody's got any thoughts about it. Uh, just unmute yourself, Peter. Hope you don't mind me calling you, Ruth, because you're really terrific, <laughs> Judy. <laughs> so uh, what's interesting is this whole business of family secrets uh, is something that, uh, that was something in our family. And uh, it always, whenever something that was a secret, which frankly was in my parents' generation, uh, they would always say the kind isn't here. Don't talk about it. And, uh, you know, I always wondered, in fact, my kids, my kids also have, uh, have, have commented on the fact that, that there were secrets in the family, some of which I knew about and could explain to them, which I am glad to do and give some background as best I knew it. But it seemed to be a generational thing back then, is that obviously the one you're talking about is, you, you know, you can understand why there would be a family secret, maybe. But it, it, uh, it obviously permeated in mine and uh, even to my kids, uh, who are not so kids anymore. My older son is 54. But the point is, is that uh, it, it, it seems to have been a generational thing. I don't know. I could ask others what they think as to whether or not that was something that permeated their families. But it certainly did in mine. Your family sounds like mine, Peter. <laughs> Maybe we're related. You may not. <laughs> yeah. Um, can, can you hear me? Am I unmuted? Yeah. Yes. Oh, hi. Um, my feeling was, yes, I knew there were family secrets that were kept very much. I was a little surprised, though, that such a secret could be kept in such a, when the Florence was in the hospital. I mean, there were so many people coming in and out of her room that knew about it that I find it hard to believe that nobody let it go either accidentally or on purpose, by the way. Um, Judith, you know what else I also, I don't know where this fits in, but I was, um, I was interested in the fact that one of the hotels in this Jewish enclave was, was very anti-Semitic, right? Right. They wouldn't, allow, they wouldn't allow Jews in. So I just wanted to present that to you as an idea to be thought about. Absolutely. And that's a big factor in the story too in the background. Carol? Okay. First of all, I was 
not able to answer you as far as going to Atlantic City. I have a picture of my grandmother with a fur coat on, <laughs> and I figure that it was probably cheaper in the, in the winter, and that's why we went there then. The other thing is that family secrets, we have, my father had a first cousin who my grandmother used to send money to. Um, she'd go around to the relatives and collect money because this cousin was in medical school in Germany in the 30s. His, wow. his children never knew because being who I am, I looked up the daughter and found out who she was. She never knew that her father was Jewish, except certain things like they were raised Episcopalian and he never went to church. And they took the, he took them to Syracuse. He named her after his mother and his da other daughter after my grandmother. So we have a whole bunch of secrets that I'm not going to bore everybody with. But yes, there are secrets. Now, as far as the book goes, I think in those days, they could keep secrets much better than we could. There was no internet. There was barely a television. So it was easier. That's all. Okay. I was going to say my family uh, had a similar type of thing. My grandmother's 16-year-old sister died a couple of days before my grandmother gave birth to my father, who was her first child. And they kept the secret. In fact, my grandmother named my father and then his name was changed to name for her sister when they told her just before the bris that her sister had died. So this was something that definitely occurred. My father was born in 1927, so similar timing to this kind of thing. So, you know, it was something that was kept as a secret for, uh, you know, in actual life. Um, I'd like to can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear Anne? me? Anne. Yes, I'm sorry. Why don't we just say our names when we, we start so that everybody knows who's speaking? Anne Peskin. Anne Peskin. Uh, two things. One, I rode in one of those uh, um, parts on uh, Atlantic City with my <laughs> grandmother and grandfather. And two, many years later, when we were first married in 1954, we went down to Atlantic City with another couple and lived through pretty much of what you were talking about. And thirdly, we kept the gerbil's death, a secret from my daughter who was in college because we felt it would affect her. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, had, I had a lot of trouble though with their hiding the father getting rid of the husband. Ah. That was crossing a line that troubled me. I don't know, did anyone else feel that way? I, I, um, I didn't get into that, but it's a whole other aspect of, uh, of, 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 of the relationship there. Um, Fanny, this kind of docile daughter and what the father did to, in his words, think about it. You know, it is interesting to do both with um, keeping the secret from her about uh, Florence's death and also about how he dispatched her husband. Um, you wonder whether parents were much more uh, able to control the lives of their kids than they are today. But should he have? <laughs> what, yes. What, what's the moral choice? Uh, yes. Yeah, I felt that I'm starting to think as I'm listening to this that it depends on the kind of secret that was kept. So adoption was a big secret in my family. No, uh -huh. I never knew that my cousin was adopted. And I'm not sure that her children know she's passed away that she was adopted, but yet my mother was pregnant with me out in California and her mother and her sister died. So she had to take a train home while my father was shipped up. So they didn't keep the death a secret, but yet they kept adoption. There was a divorce, like one cousin ran away and left his wife. I just heard that he, you know, he was sick somewhere. You know, so I guess maybe it depends on the kind of secret is what I was wondering about. Good point. It, it's uh, Marcy Schoenfeld. 
in my family, we called it, my mother used to call them white lies. They weren't lies. They were white lies because <laughs> they were intended to protect someone. And that's what I thought this was. And for those who read the book, she really goes to, they go to great lengths to prevent, uh, uh, you Fanny. know, Fanny from knowing. I really felt sorry for Gusty to try to, to not, you know, tell. She would, couldn't even see her mother because they were afraid she would slip. Uh, unless the grandmother was there. Uh, I don't know who said about the ending, um, but I felt the same way. I sort of felt like she wasn't sure how to end the book. And so it became a very bad ending, getting rid of the husband. Yes. I you know, see. sending him to Florida. Yeah. Um, and I thought that that was beyond the pale, that at least he should have been there for the birth of his child and at least saying, you know, this is not working. I mean, he was unhappy in the marriage. She's unhappy in the marriage. So it's not that far-fetched, but since they went through so much to have this other kid, I just, I, I thought it was beyond the payoff for having to have to leave before the baby was born. I realized the father thought that once he saw the baby, he wouldn't leave, mm -hmm. you know, but he needed the money. He was committed to that money. He needed those, that money to get his dream of land in Florida. Mm -hmm. I, I'd like to just I, jump in here for a second, um, Barbara. Um, at a very young age, my, grandma, my grandmother taught me Yiddish, and at a very young age, I learned the word Shonda, disgrace. And um, the English equivalent was you don't uh, air your dirty, lin um, dirty linen in public. But I just finished a, a wonderful book called American Baby, and it's about adoption. And when uh, a girl got pregnant out of wedlock, they were shipped off to a maternity home. They weren't allowed to hold their babies. And uh, the, the um, Louise Weiss was the a largest um, adoption agency. And the things that they committed were horrific. Yes. Uh, first of all, they um, didn't uh, uh, let people adopt their, their children until some, somewhere between eight months and as much as two years, which are very important years in a child's development. Um, I would strongly recommend that book. Also, when the uh, pregnant woman, the, when she got married and she had her first, uh, she had a second baby, the doctor entered it on the baby's birth certificate as her firstborn child. Mm -hmm. that, that's how much they tried to cover up. Um, Barbara, there's a great movie on the triplets that were adopted through the right. ICE agency. Yes. And if you haven't seen that, that's a wonderful talking about the abuse they had and all three <laughs> kids are screwed up. Yes. Yes. Yeah. First of all, you don't separate multiple births. It has a profound impact on the babies. Um, babies thrive much better when, when they're in the same crib. And these babies weren't uh, adopted um, until they were, I think, maybe a year old. Anyway, <laughs> it, it's a great read. I, I strongly recommend now it. And this took place in the 60s. Uh, Barbara, uh, repeat the title again, American? American Baby. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> I, I think it's, this is Liz, I think it's um, ironic that the father was really against lying to the daughter, but yet he then perpetrated his own lie, which was a bigger, much bigger lie. Neat. Because it, it was a forever lie versus you knew the sister would find out her sister had died as soon as the baby was born. But somebody mentioned that there hadn't been any, that, it, that Jews often went to Atlantic City because there was no anti-Semitism. But that was a big theme there, that the, the, the um, coach's hotel wouldn't right. allow Jews. I, I'm sure there were places, but I think in general, uh, maybe the Jews knew where to go and where not to go. Uh, yeah. And in and, and general, the atmosphere was, was more open than some other areas of um, vacation land were. 
I have a dirty little secret. Uh, I have it on very good authority that my sister-in-law has a stepbrother. When I talked to my sister-in-law about it, she said, oh no, my father would never do that. Okay, so now she has offspring, her children who are my dear nephews. So I have this dirty little secret. <laughs> his mother does not wish to approach. So I don't know what to do with this because I feel my nephew. Well, it's know. now public because it's being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we'll be on our website. <laughs> my name, my name is uh, Margaret. This is Margaret. <laughs> 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 But you know, also you can't keep a secret if somebody else knows about it. Right. But I am keeping it because I don't want to, <laughs> I don't know what to do about it. <laughs> I did tell my children that they should know in case someday maybe this might be interesting news to their cousins. Huh. I, I got caught in a family secret. My father had always told me that his brother had been married, um, came back from the war, immediately got married, and then it was annulled. And I just assumed that was family knowledge. And going through my father's stuff when he died, my cousin was kind of next to me. I said, oh, this is, this is the announcement for your father's first wedding. You might want this. He did not know. Wow. Oh, my. And I... That's that's the kind of thing that is likely to happen. And where, where is it better coming from? Right. I think with the DNA today, it's harder to keep a secret. My former sister-in-law, I guess she had, and he never knew this, of course, I guess she had a baby who got pregnant when she was in high school and they shipped her off to a home and they lived in Seattle. She went to California. Um, my husband had been at college, away at college at the time, so he didn't know. And the last five years, this baby found her through oh, wow. DNA and, wow. her and claimed her. And they had a big, you know, reunion. She had to tell her children and the family. Um, it's so DNA. And then my cousin, one of the secrets who ran away, um, he had three children here. He left his wife and his three kids, never, um, he's, you know, this is Jewish, never um, divorced her, went to, followed somebody to Ireland, had three more children in Ireland, and the Irish cousin has contacted me through DNA. Oh my, wow. So he asked, he said, I think, I don't know anything about my father's family, and I sent him pictures of me with his father, but I, I didn't tell, you know, I'm not, again, what do you, what do you say? You know, it's, it's a, so family secrets are harder to keep today, I think. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I had a secret that I would tell my parents, but I signed up. Um, yeah. I have a question for you, Judy. Sure. Two yes. questions, really. I like the idea that it was broken up into chapters from different people's point of view. Right. I, I, I personally like that. I don't know if you did. And the second question is, I would have liked the epilogue to be a prologue because I might have looked at things differently if I know that, knew that this was based on a family story. Um, I'm, what I'm, about you? I, um, I'm just wondering. I, I, I seem to have known that pretty early on. I don't know whether it came up in... I think you might have read it in a review. Oh, probably, probably. Um, it's kind of a nice surprise to have it come okay. at the end. Uh, but by the way, she did say in an interview, people asked her, why didn't you tell us what Fanny's reaction was? They should have had a chapter where the mother and father went up into the hospital room and then told her uh, about Isaac and about her sister. Um, but uh, she said that she felt there was no need to do that, that it would just kind of, complicate the ending and uh she she didn't want to get into that i mean i think it's a great place to start her second novel <laughs> but I, i'm sure she won't she is working on something else yes i like the idea of the chapters being a different perspective 
Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure that's hard to write that way too. Yeah. You know, when you do Tolstoy, okay. um, War and Peace, I read it. I read the war and they were different chapters. And then I read the romance and I would go through the book that way. Interesting. So Sh Sheldon has a, a family secret to reveal too. <laughs> you want to get me on? Then. You're on. Where am I? Okay. Here. Okay, this is um, a bit of a secret that I never told my parents about. Uh, when I was in college, back in the early 50s, I graduated 55, uh, the war in uh, Korea had just ended. What? Go ahead. Uh, she wants me to, if I can end it in the next 30 seconds, it'll take longer than that. So um, I, I, I got enthused with serving um, uh, the country um, in the military, which was totally different than anything anybody in our family had ever done. And then most of them went to medical school, or law school, or wherever the, wherever our kids have ended up. Um, so I slipped a piece of paper to my mom. I say, Mom, could you uh, just sign this thing? She said, Well, what is it? Oh, I said, It's really nothing. It's just you know an ROTC. You just had to sign something. So my mom, much to my surprise, didn't even really ask me to look at. Didn't ask if she could look at the paper. She signed it. And what it was that I was agreeing to serve on active duty after graduation. And that's uh, got, I had a bug for flying at the time. And my goal was um, graduating college was, was an irrelevancy, which I did and did fairly well. Uh, but uh, I, I ended up flying in the Air Force and never really told my parents what they had signed. Uh, and flying in the Air Force was not of any particular danger. I mean, either you live or you die. It's, there's no problem about it. Uh, and they had absolutely no idea what they had agreed to. Uh, and I never really told them until they came down to visit me once when I was going through flight school way down in deep Texas. And my father, who was thoroughly Jewish, uh, he was a jeweler, spoke only Yiddish, uh, at least at work, but his English was okay. Uh, just couldn't understand where he was, what he was doing. I took him to the Alamo. They knew nothing. They couldn't understand anything. And the secret, I guess, was they never knew what they agreed to send their son to. And I thought it was the best years of my life until I got <laughs> married. <laughs> and thank goodness he survived. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay. All right. Go ahead. All right. I guess um, I thank everybody for your attention and for your opinions. And um, and there are no more secrets. <laughs> thank okay. you. You did a wonderful presentation. Thank you, Judy. Yes. Thank you. Really good. Very thank good you. presentation. Very interesting.